Pandey has undertaken several UGC-sponsored research projects and has published extensively, including books and over 40 research papers in national and international journals. He has supervised numerous PhD scholars and actively participated in seminars, conferences, and workshops. Additionally, Professor Pandey has served in various administrative capacities and as a member of prestigious academic committees and expert panels. Today, he will be speaking on Binarism at its best, the poetry of Jayanta Mahapatra. I welcome you, sir, to this. Last but certainly not the least, our very own Professor Sanjay Dattaroy, former HOD, Department of English and Modern European Languages, University of Allahabad. Sir needs no introduction, but with your permission, sir, I would be honored to say a few words about you. Thank you. Professor Sanjay Dattaroy retired in May 2023 as professor and head of Department of English and Modern European Languages, Dean, Faculty of Arts, Director, Center for Film and Theatre, Coordinator, Center for Media Studies, University of Allahabad. In 1995-1996, he was a senior Fulbright Fellow, Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, USA. In 2004-2005, he was Fulbright Visiting Professor at Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Okay, Berkeley. That is also mentioned. Jadavpur is also mentioned. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So, he was a Fulbright Visiting Professor at University of California, Berkeley, USA. He has published several books and research papers in India and abroad. And he was also invited to deliver talks on theatre in India in 2016 and 2019 to the University of Connecticut store and also University of California, Berkeley, USA. A hearty welcome to you, sir. And now, without further ado, I request Professor Sandra Dattaroy, sir, to uh, take over the stage and uh, with your opening remarks, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Down memory lane for me as well. Uh, my association with Jayanta Mahapatra has been very, very intense. I met him first at the residence of Professor Pilal. Pilal had actually brought out his book of poems, Relationships, which came out from Writer's Workshop. And later, my book, The Absent Words, also, was also brought out by Pilal. I remember a discussion that happened at that time, which particularly sort of stuck home. There was a poem in my book of poems for the absent words. It was called Some Scars Remain. S O N E some S C A R S Scars Remain. I remember Pilar's comment. He said, Is it some scars? Remain or is it some scars remain? Some scars, right? And I think that appeal a lot to Lahad Mahamatra. Later, of course, you see, I met him in Shantiniketan. At that time, Milan Gomorrahundi was alive and it was at his place where he spent a lovely evening discussing poetry. And it was at that time that I presented Jayanta Mahapatra with my book of poems. And, but before that, you see, what my relationship is basically at the level of uh, uh, being an, a poet, from one poet to the other. It was nothing academic, there was nothing theoretical in it. Even. It was the response of one poet to another poetry, and it, was, it remained that. I remember, you see, he had published about four of my poems in the journal that he brought out. Actually, that was not mentioned. 
For a long time, he got out of his journal for the Chandra of Mata. It was one of the seminal journals at that time. Now, of course, you see, poetry and publishing, poetry is totally online, and there is a lot of distribution, a lot of people reading it. But at that time, you only had a few places where you would publish. Chandra Bhada was one such place where you could find good poetry in published. And I was very happy when he chose four of my poems for Chandra Bhada, and he also got out the reviews of my books in Chandra Bhada. Right? But more important than that was much later, much later when he was not too well, I think he was suffering, you know, he had a lot of physical ailments at that time. At that time, interestingly, I received a letter from him. Unfortunately, I couldn't fish it out yesterday, you know, because I got to know about this just two days back, and I was desperately trying to look for it. I couldn't find it. But I remember the gist of what he said. The one who came from the public in Chandra Bhada, he said that the last lines of both these poems really grew over the years. And today, when he was, I and mean, he said that he was in the of his life, he felt the meaning all the more. And that was something new for me because I wrote it when I was a young person. And today, when I finished out those poems, I will just share those poems with you because they are very short. So, I mean, they will not take too much time. But then the last lines of the poems are the ones that, that he's talking about. The first one is called Peace. This is from the absent words brought out by Rajas Workshop. It's about an element. It's, it's called Peace. The Lord Tusker sought the silence of the deep forest. The Lord Tusker sought the silence of the deep forest. Battles hard and violent. He noticed the sound of the beat. Battles hard and violent. He noticed the insult of the beat. There's a disturbance in the mind. Right? Are you going to go to the words? And maybe I'll, I'll speak a little on the offside. Right? The Lord Tuska sought the silence of the deep forest. Battles hard and tired, he missed the insult of defeat. The memory of an impersonate boom beat a wild trumpeting. The memory of an impersonate boom brought a wild trumpeting as he charged madly at shadows. The memory of an impertinent bull brought a wild trumpeting as he charged madly at shadows. The stony predators of the night moved quietly away, out of his way, in respect and fear. The stony predators of the night moved quietly away in respect and fear. Crashing through trees, he spent his entire night alone. Crashing through trees, he spent his entire night energy finding his place among ancestral bones. The last two lines, I will repeat it again, which were his favorite lines. He spent his entire night energy finding his place among ancestral bones. Mana for the word that I know of Buddha doesn't significantly. One is that the ancestor of many of the mammoths, right? The Buddha mammoth is a dinosaur, right? And elephant seeds. The skeletal uh devil place is equal. I mean all elephants have to be see that place, they die there, and the skeletal remains of the elephants are there, right? So we do Okay, okay. This side? Yes, this yeah, side. Yeah. Fine. So the last time wants to know, he spent his entire mammoth energy finding his place among ancestral bones. This was one. And the other, the middle shoulder, is called the diver. The last line of this poem also reads a lot to it. He began in shallow waters, frolicking among carps and trouts. He began in shallow waters, 
frolicking among gobs and doubts, went home to test the snapping jaws of piranhas. Went home to test the snapping jaws of piranhas. Then chose the inky silence of watery depths. Then chose the inky silence of watery depths as the green barracudas streamed past. Then chose the inky silence of watery depths as growing barracudas streaked past. Trembling with fear and excitement, he saw, rising out of Devonian depths, sorry, he saw, rising out of primitive depths, Devonian monsters shrouding in the green whites. He saw, rising out of primitive depths, Devonian monsters shaping into red whites. Now he swims in the tranquil presence of blue whales. Now he swims in the tranquil presence, presence of blue whales. These last lines appeal a lot to the end. So in his memory, I recited these poems and these were brought out in the Chandra Bhaga by him. I remember that. So I do not want to see Jayant Mahapatra academically or theoretically. I see him as a poet who appeals to the poetic sense of it. There is something in his symbolism. And it is he who, in fact, told me, even at that time, you see, that I should move on to transcreate, because transcreate was a word that Pete Lal used to remember a lot. And it was in that conversation that it came up that I should move on to transcreate the Bible of Bengal, the folk singers of Bengal, which I am doing now post-retirement, right? Maybe what I'll do is I'll share one or two of all of you tomorrow in the poetry session, with that poetry that I'm doing on Baud, especially on Manu Bhuti and Shah Abdul Karim. These are the two I'm working on. And also the folk songs of S.D. Bhaman, the songs of Abdul Prashad Sain, Tagore, of course, is there. So that entire involvement in transcreation, because I am not too happy with the word translation, because it is very difficult to translate poetry from one language to the other, mainly when you are working with songs and lyrics, because the sound matters. You cannot get, get a replicate of the same sound. And as a result, the meter and the rhythm will go. It will just go awry. So basically, you can come to close proximity. It can never be exact as far as the sound is concerned. You can get the cultural nuances, maybe, and maybe certain other cultural nuances get added, as Narada said. And whether it Octavio Paz or Narada said, if you translate me, make me better, right? From what the original is. So it is something, you know, where one culture works on another culture and a third product is born, you see, which cannot be called exactly a translation, especially in poetry and in songs, right? I know a lot of these issues will be coming up. You see, oral poetry, performative poetry, poetry, you see, which is not written poetry. You see, because I think, you see, when we're talking about his translating from Korea to English, we are talking about you see, two completely different traditions of poetry. And as very rightly pointed out by Professor S.K. Sharma, that you see, most of the Indian poetry that was written in English followed the same tradition which were there in British poetry. When the Georgians were there, we were following the Georgian poetry. When the modernists came into existence, we were the modernists, you know. That was one part of our tradition of in, in other languages. So always you see the bilingual poet, you see, who is working simultaneously in two languages, you see, who is translating, transcreating, will bring a certain richness into Indian poetry written in, in English, which a single a poet will write using the single language of English, you see, he will never be able to get, you see, because then he will be only following the traditions, you know, which were said by the Georgians, the modernists, and the uh, and the poets there, you see. Now that is exactly what was happening, but when we see poets like Kolatkar, when we see poets like Alha Shahid Ali, 
when you see poets like Jayanta Mahapatra, we see the richness because of the dual, dual language tradition or multiple language tradition that are working in the English country. I'm sure these issues are going to be taken up in the seminar. I'm very happy to be called here as a chairperson. It's good, you know, post retirement, one is a free person. Of course, I'm not, you know, I'm roaming around all over the place. But then you see, I was, I'm so happy that uh, Sushil remembered me, all me, and also many other people who have retired. I'm sure they are also feeling very happy about it. And of course, you see, the greatest pleasure is meeting all the young faces, you know, which I've been missing intensely post retirement, you see, and all my young friends. Thank you. I would like to invite the first uh, plenary speaker. I, I, I. Uh -huh. Sure, sir. Anytime. Huh? Oh, she says that the question answers will be at the end of the session. Okay. Okay. It's immediate. immediate. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, right, sir. What can you say on the question of Mr. Kedish wants to? Mubaya. Sorry, Mubaya. Okay, okay. Mubaya. Mubaya. Yeah. Certainly. No, sir. I, I would not say that it is. I mean, I would not go with Pablo Neruda and say, you know, that make it better. I would say that, you see, it was like almost a new world that was created, you know, and it was steeped in a tradition which was not integral in the British tradition or the English tradition at all. It added something new to a, a language and its heritage. You see, something that didn't exist. Absolutely, sir. That is exactly where the genius comes in. Thank you. I now invite Professor Shravani Vishnash to the days. Respected uh, Chief Guest Professor Srivastava and other respected dignitaries. Esteemed faculty members and uh, guests, beloved students, scholars. Uh, actually, uh, throughout the morning, we have been listening to wisdom from the dignitaries. And humbly, I can say that I don't think I'll be able to add to that wisdom. Uh, when I was uh, preparing my presentation, it was because I wanted to pay a homage to my one of my favorite poets, uh, Jayanta Mahapatra, whom I had met a few times. And uh, the best way to pay homage is recite more and comment less, because poetry is meant not to be, not to mean, but to be experienced. And whatever little I have uh, written, I think I would be addressing more to the student audience because it will be something, you know, humble. Uh, I'll begin with a recitation, of course, not recitation. I'm reading out a quotation, my favorite poem. It was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back. The fisherman said, will you have her? carelessly, trailing his nets and nerves, as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself. I saw his white bone thrash his eyes. What do I write to honor a poet who at first appeared to me in his poetry and then turned into an enigma when in the classroom I struggle to capture the ephemeral and the elusive metaphors and images and attempted to explain them to my students in so many words. How does the fisherman train his nerves? What is the connection between his hopeless nets that cannot catch a fish and his nerves when perhaps for the first time he is offering his daughter to a stranger. What exactly is that emotion which is as stark as white bones that thrash his eyes? 
here is a poet who i realized could stretch beyond the limitations of language to capture the mysterious workings of the human mind engaged with ontological questions teaching his poems in a classroom of youths who are trained in rational discourse brings me face to face with the problems of translatable translatability of reality yes here reality is not merely the surface experience but some epiphanic vision here is another example at times a man who knows plays with a knife on its edge the stars shake pitifully what is this reality that is not easily comprehended why is it so complex in india modernity came with colonialism when india faced the west with both expectation and apprehension but we may note that like the pre war and post war west indian modernity may be divided between the colonial and post colonial that is that begins from the 50s and 60s how would one not notice derosio's harp of india and and any poem from the post 50s when india had grown accustomed to english as a language of freedom so there is a difference which i have i would like to uh, make note of derosio boys evokes the much needed nationalist fervor a pride in the indian past why hangest thou lonely on yon yedard withered bow unstrung forever must thou there remain thy music once was sweet he uses the harp as a symbol of india's tradition a paradoxical expression for the harp as a symbol is imported from the west but by then though english the west had invaded the indian mind so that indian modernity itself turned upon its own head but post 1947 there was a dialectical turn when indian writers using the same english attempted to capture this experience of disorientation of rupture of fragmentariness derosio like the english romantics had a faith in reestablishing the indian past in a new garment but it was not to be so once colonial capitalism settles in there is a rupture the post independence writers had realized that so the poetry changed radically take for instance ramanujan's poem prayers to lord murugan he writes lord of the 12 right hands why are we your mere men with the two left hands capable of only casting reflections do the poem sounds religious a prayer to lord murugan it is devoid of faith the praying voice is simply a poetic posture and creates an irony of the modern self which is denuded of such faith it simply rings of the rupture which derosio had failed to foresee this is clear when he writes immediately after this lot of headlines help us read the small print the newspaper is a space that mirrors india's suffering masses yet we have lost the five senses to empathize it so the poet turns to create a language that is so incomprehensible because experience itself has turned incoherent and inaccessible to language but now i will turn to jayanta mahapatra again what did he say about this change in his article poetry as freedom he says that the british occupation of india had given new blood to an almost stagnant literary scene with its import of new forms and ideas but it was only after freedom that english actually turned creative 
with a new seriousness with introspection revision of values and also a frankness which was not perceived earlier according to him the regional writings too were changing significantly how do i assess jayanta mahapatra as a modern poet or avant-garde of india i would take only his english works and while i read and even when i met him my only gut feeling was though in his huge in this huge multi ethnic space called india the poets writing in english are a minuscule group yet mahapatra stands out to be a lonely figure away from the stars absorbed in his own esoteric journey if the famous bombay poets were the avant cards mahapatra created his own esoteric world while writing down my thoughts i decided to first try and trace the poet's evaluation of himself as one among the galaxy of indian anglophone poets bruce king has placed him among the indian modernists who while experimenting with the form broke away from the earlier notions of reality undoubtedly with the forced imposition of a colonial culture on india this was inevitable he writes the fracturing of reality has been one of india's cultural inheritances from colonialism and from its rapid modernization since independence mahapatra too had identified his poetic pursuit as that of a modernist in his essay slow swing and dim night mahapatra writes with no basic knowledge of making a poem my efforts were in all probability directed towards something new a modernity in poetry but what is it that instinctively strikes the poet as modernity in his poetic venture here i would make my approach from the writer's self contemplation my aim is not to reiterate the fact of modernist qualities in mahapatra but the felt modernity of the poet this would be a kind of upside down exercise in contrast to the formalist trend of focusing on the text as the uh, kind of point of meaning mahapatra beside writing poetry has left a trail of prose that is his own reflection on indian modern poetry and his own exploration of the poetic self he often sounds like a western existentialist and often an indian mystic i would try to read between the lines and try to see why such alienation what forms captured that alienation and what waves of joy and despair did he write in his poetic journey if he was so incomprehensible which was his conscious choice how did his sensitive soul talk to the reader what was his relation to the reader and the outer world a poet is a product of the world that is the ground upon which he grows like a tree the roots branches and leaves feeding upon the reality of the atmospheric ethos do we connect mahapatra's alienation to the condition of modern west that was imported to india or is it a unique indian sense of alienation that came with colonization if so do i categorize him with all the bombay poets like sk jesuza uh, arun bolatkar in the university syllabus as a key ramanujan and mahapatra are you know uh, presented together as the three giants while ramanujan is a poet of strong wit mahapatra hardly you know is with, you know he doesn't use wit he his tone is more sincere so there is a vast difference and this is indian poetry in english first i would like to show that india as a colonized country had to tread the destined path 
it had to be a strange bedfellow of a foreign language and culture and the result was complex and ambiguous because it was enslaved to a foreigner's rule india despite subservience and degradation was also inspired and morally stimulated under the incentive of nationalism to raise her head against challenges this was not the holiness of moral decadence that reigns in the poetry of eliot or ezra pound moreover despite being debatable the entry of a new language which brought with it new epistemology and forms of expression had stimulated many indians for self expression english in india had been responsible for indian modernity in the sense that it provided scopes of new experiments with form and language this was not really a path of joy but a realization of falling in love with the language that had once been the language of the ruler sujata bhat in her poem a different history writes and how does it happen that after the torture after the soul has been cropped with a long sky sweeping out of the conqueror's face the unborn children grandchildren grow to love that strange language such ironies of fate bring in a sense of alienation after the initial enthusiasm when with time and maturity a self reflexivity settled in as a new awareness the same english which had invigorated creativity created a deep split which took the form of frustration sujata bhat writes about the split between the desire to write in one's mother tongue but choosing to write in english days my tongue slips away i can't hold on to my tongue it's slippery like the lizard tail i try to grasp it but the lizard darts away she finds a way of inserting gujarati into her english poems this is her own way of dealing with bilingualism which characterizes the indian english writers but before this awareness there was a happy flourish of poetry in english a language that got new ideas and forms this freshness of form and expression had revitalized even literature in the native tongues which gm navy means bhasha literature but along with the language indians had entered a strange world of aesthetic imaginary indian literature culled indian similes and metaphors that grew naturally in the british soil very soon roses lilies nightingales harps lyres Dance and poems captured the literary imaginary. Aurobindo writes, "Bride of fire, I have shed the bloom of the earthly rose." Or Dirosio chants, "Oh no, where dance pressed on high appears, faint as the memory of a departing year." This slipped into the Indian landscape, both physical and mental. and joined hands with indian flora and fauna sarojini naidu a poet that had interspersed english with indian words tell me no more of thy love papiha would thou recall to my heart papiha dreams of delight that are gone we may note that while nightingales harps or dyers now integrated in the western culture of poetry had collected layers of semiotic significance to turn them into active metaphors the papihas palanquins bangle sellers the new entries in english in india and acted mostly to indianize the subject of theme thus unlike the british or american writers whose poems were integrated in their landscape indian english poetry worked on double consciousness the imaginary and the felt reality john oliver perry in his paper on mahapatra writes no matter how modified as english 
in English. It is inherently, structurally, and governmentally adapted from a culture geographically, historically, and socially English. Now here there might be some debate. This fractured subjectivity of an Indian poet is, in a way, caused by Indian modernity, which is a colonial product. Jean Davy, in his book After Amnesia, writes that the modern idea of India as a cultural level, level is hopelessly inadequate and simplistic. A product of colonial historiography, the term brings with it a politically colored self image and the suggestion of cultural amnesia. This fracture happened under the influence of the British cultural imperialism, where India's connection with its literary past was forcefully disrupted. JV calls it a disfiguring colonial epistemology, which has created frameworks of cultural values and stratified knowledge into superior Western and inferior Indian categories. Such rupture with the Indian past created a kind of alienation which is different from that we find in Western modernism. In the West, the world wars had created a hollowness, an experience in di direct contrast to the pre-war times. But the past continued to exist in the form of nostalgia. According to Tammy Tewell, modernist nostalgia involves a ten tension between past and present that structures many of the most well-known texts of the period. In the tension between a backward-looking and forward-looking impulse, modernist writers have discovered the potential for a productive dialogue where the past is brought into conversation with the present. But in India, especially the writers in English, did not find the necessary tradition as an anchor from where to digress into a dialectical journey. I'm specifically talking about just the post-war writers, not the present ones, which includes Jantam Mahapatra. Perry writes, if an Indo-English poet like Mahapatra must work in the absence of any appropriately hyphenated, that is culturally mixed yet indigenous tradition, his only alternative is to adapt some type or other of the Anglo American modernist, avant garde or postmodernist styles as tradition. Tradition in the sense that T.S. Eliot had mentioned. You know, a poet has to go back to tradition to write poetry. Mahapatra no doubt follows a similar path of desire that had haunted the modernist in the West. No doubt. He follows a similar path, uh, sorry, he wants to write something fresh. And so uh, he writes, undeniably, I did want to write poems that would be different from those that still stuck to my mind from my school days. And who are these poets? Obviously the romantics. He, they stuck to his mind and he was trying his best to come out of it. And uh, I think, you know, this romantics, when they were uh, brought to the syllabus of uh, India, they, there was a politics behind it to impose the British culture upon the Indian mind to serve the purpose. And, uh, you know, Mahapatra's desire to come out of this cultural and literary hegemony may also be considered as an Indianity which characterizes post-colonial modernism. I'll give an example. The poem River is a good example. Dawn's bone white land, and in it, the shut iron palanquin of the river, the cracked stone in mountains sprawled on the chest of this ruined town. Now compare it to the poem Palanquin Bearers by Sarojini Naidu. Lightly, oh lightly, we bear her along. She sways like a flower in the wind of our song. The image of the palanquin is common in both the poems. But while Sarojini romanticizes it, Mahapatra subverts this poetic canon. 
while Sarojini's poem is swept by a splurge of beautiful images like flower, foam of a stream, or pearl on a stream. In Mahapatra's poem, the palanquin is an extended metaphor which expresses the poem's psychological reaction that the river evokes. He creates a sensory paradox when the fluidity of the river is shut in the image of an iron palanquin and thus creates a shock in understanding. By forcing together two completely unrelated objects, he creates a landscape that is jagged like a cubist painting, fragmented and abstracted, but capable of capturing the inner dimension of the town with the river by it. Sarojini's poem hides the reality of the palanquin bearer's labor by implying joy in bearing the palanquin, which seems light as a flower. Mahapatra's palanquin is iron heavy, for the man that perceives it is struggling for freedom from death, which the landscape delineates. Not only in Mahapatra's poetry, but also in his interviews and articles, we can trace a sense of alienation. Now, is this the general sense of alienation that is inherent in Western modernism? Is it the loneliness in a crowd in the unreal city when Eliot writes, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowing over London Bridge? So many, I had not thought death had undone so many. Perhaps not. The Elitian alienation is the post war self as hell that had infected the West referred to in the cocktail party. What is hell? Hell is oneself. Hell is alone. The other figures in it merely projections. There is nothing to escape from and nothing to escape to. One is always alone. It is the general decadence of the euro, the 20th century life as living death. It is a spiritual alienation of the urbanized West. Peter Gay in his book Modernism writes, the seedbed of modernism was assembled from the widely distributed prosperity in industrializing and urbanizing states. He added that the factory system, which began in England and then spread all over Europe, advanced the culture of mass production and consumption which also included art. That means art became a kind of uh, saleable thing. But in India, though the Bombay poets represented the urban and the elite, this was not necessarily the precondition for modernism. In fact, Mahapatra's poetry very often represents the people and the landscape of a backward state of India, which was not completely industrialized or urbanized. But the possibility of alienation lies here. The economic gaps between states, between the elite and the middle class, the rich and the poor, the urban and the provincial. Mahapatra's was a lonely voice that was created in the uneven economic development of India. Once in an interview, he tells Sarangi, Sarangi asks him, what school do you belong to, sir? Mahapatra had answered, school? What school? I mean, I wrote because I wanted to. I have not studied literature or poetry. I'm ignorant of schools of poetry. I don't know if I should belong to a school. This obviously reminds us of the Bombay School of Poets, who were and still are a prominent group, who were urban elites sometimes living abroad and sometimes in Bombay. In fact, many of the Bombay poets, whole books have been written on them, Anjali Malekar and Mehrotra. But Mahapatra, when he met him, he had been always very, you know, like, uh, sad about it, that, you know, not good criticism was written. John Oliver Perry writes that Mahapatra has not joined them in living abroad and writing a poetry of alienation and exile. He describes Mahapatra as a poet 
working practically alone as a village dwelling teacher of college physics in a poor eastern province. In India, the fruits of development did not reach evenly to the masses, creating fresh divisions between states and communities. And this continued to increase with time. Therefore, it would not be wrong to say that such discriminations affected the field of literature and culture. One burning example is, you know, the recognition of the Northeast poets. You know, very, very late. The recognition was very, very late. Once Mahapatra tells Abraham, another interviewer, my books of poetry strangely don't get reviewed in Indian periodicals. Why? It is difficult to say. And the very few which appear at times are discouraging. Why does this happen? I ask myself. Is it because I don't grovel before editors and reviewers? Or is it because I live in a rural, remote and backward state of India? I don't have any answer to these. Again, Mahapatra, it, you know, for Mahapatra, it was a double alienation. I will not talk about it. It has been spoken uh, about like his alienation in Orissa itself. And, uh, you know, uh, a state which is very, you know, in the shadow. And there also he lived somewhere, you know, in the boundary because as a Christian, he is looking at the uh, culture which is oriented around the temple of Lord Jagannatha, and it was his felt reality. So, while a feeling of alienation draws him to English, so he, you know, sometimes uh, English kind of is like a panacea. It helps him. It gives him a freedom from this ambiguity in which he is situated. So, writing in English also, so there is there are two sides. You know, English, writing in English frees him, gives him freedom, but at the same time, paradoxically, it also alienates him. That also has been speaking in the spoken. His own state did not read his poetry. The languages spoken in the roots and corners of daily reality are different, which the poet must import to a different medium. A poet is a sensitive receptor. This is the last part of my talk. A poet is a sensitive receptor of the seismic changes and complexities that troubles the world around him. The condition of modern India and Orissa, as the poet had experienced, is described by Mahapatra himself. In his earlier mind, space and time, sound and silence, motion and linear and cyclic and world and symbol become one. The resulting poetry is sure to lose its concreteness, taking the realm to where clarity gets lost. It's a joy to read his prose too, because his prose sounds either like philosophy or like poetry. And the more he enters this dense and opaque world of language, the more he enters a realm of freedom. Truth, or the really real, really real, which Virginia Woolf had once said, is often given beyond words. And like every modern poet, Mahapatra had aspired to capture the language of silence. In art, it is a language that aspires to the condition of music, as Ezra Pound had once said. Perhaps in this condition of music, the poet tastes freedom. He writes in his article, Poetry as Freedom. What is freedom? Is it the path through unknown places of the heart? A path that is both unreal and of a transcendent nature, and yet is something that foresees the event of death? What is this death? What death is he mentioning of? Not the real death, I'm sure. No one, you know, speaks about death, the real death. But there are many kinds of death. And it reminded me of Mikhail Bhakti in Art and Answerability. He's talking about the death of Newman very beautifully. According to Mikhail Bhakti, death is the completion of meaning. And every effort of the poet 
is to reach that moment of completion which keeps eluding the poet. But the journey is a joy. That means if you complete the meaning, then it is death. Mahapatra had reiterated the fact that I will reach out to the completion, but I will never reach it. So that is poetry, that is joy. I would like to end with one such example of his effort. In his writing, even a dawn in the famous temple town of Puri is surrealistic. The frail early light catches ruined leprous shells leaning against one another, a mass of crouched faces without names, and suddenly breaks out of my hide into the smoky blaze of a sullen, solitary pyre that fills my aging mother. The Jagannath Temple in Puri is a symbol of logocentricity, as if life that evolves around it is immersed in the mythical reality created by the temple. But the temple's centrality of meaning is questioned and contradicted by layers of death images, that of endless crow noses, skull on the holy sands, the empty country tilting towards hunger, the leprous shells, in short, a complex entanglement of emotions. Mahapatra is using more personalized symbols and not conventional ones which convey meaning easily. Conventional, you reach to the meaning immediately. But he is trying to stop, stop the reader to reach the meaning so easily. He's creating a barrier. In doing so, he is underscoring the indefiniteness of meaning and the ambiguous relation between the skull and the holy sand or the shells of the famous beach of Puri and leprosy. Here, if the temple is the signifier, the signified is much alienated from it. And thus, the reader's understanding of the text becomes tenuous and uncertain. Mahapatra is in search of a reader who will experience poetry and not attempt to mar it with the limitations of meaning. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inviting thoughts on Jayanta Mahapatra as a modern poet. I now invite Professor Krishna Mohan Pandey from Banaras University, and he will be speaking on Binalism and its death, the poetry of Jayanta Mahapatra. Sir, welcome you to the dais. Namaskar. Sabiko and Pranam. I am thankful to Professor Sharma and his team for giving me this opportunity to be part of this August gathering. Respected Chair, Professor uh, Ryan, and two of my mentors here, sorry, my gurus. There is a vast gap between being a mentor and a guru. Just like tradition and modernity, I'll be coming to that later. Yeah. There are two things that uh, I feel indebted to. Uh, one, the opportunity being given here, and my memory goes back to the illustrious son, the illustrious student of this university, Mahamana Pradit Madan Mohan Malviyaji, because this had been supposed to be the Oxford of the East, the seat of learning, and he wanted to have a, a model that could uh, could be that could make it better. The, uh, the Indian model where Patichi, Prachi, Tamil, Sundar, the East and West could meet, where the ancient wisdom and the contemporaneity both may live together. So thank you for uh, for this. And thank you, uh, Shamaniji, for your very well organized academic paper. Uh, I, I remember uh, the, the keynote address by uh, my friend Siddhikiji, in which he touched upon several topics 
but there is much more to share i am lucky to to be enriched by the company of jayantada it's really uh, i feel sorry uh, to have him here on this banner yeah but this is what life is my association with him goes back for more than half my life exactly 1991 when i visited his place in konya bagicha in his absence and felt sorry for it the two places netaji subhash chandra bose his birth place and in konya bagicha and of course puri and other places konark we one has to be if one is in that part but it took just a couple of years i could have him in banaras in banaras hindu university he was invited for a talk and he began with this this kind of thing who reads poetry these days professor sharma said this is a big hall we have been given no poetry lovers have always been less in number but the number doesn't matter it is a different kind of democracy so he is he wrote this sentence who reads poetry these days and one boy is to but you can't say this in banaras blunt answer blunt intervention it should not have been but i am happy that that did happen and i could and that student was no one else krishna mohan and the other sentence it should not have happened there the sir said no 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 sawal we 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 belong to a different kind of tradition sambad anvikshi ki vidya the dialogue must go on even if it is there is intervention because the intervention may also bring something new and it has uh, brought many new things also this basil plant for the first time i have i have got it in a kumbh my memory goes back to that mythical kumbh and one of those places where amrit fell down is this prayag now prayagraj happily prayagraj no political uh, overtones to be taken there but i i read this comment sir you can't say this in banaras there are two people who have read almost all of the all what you have published one was professor mehrotra i knew most of his volumes went to him except the two volumes and those two volumes were closed the sky can buy them and false start they were out of print after about uh, 25 days i received a packet a registered parcel which contained those two volumes that was the blessing of blank da for me and that was are uh, the bond that took so deep a root bond of affection and friendship that lasted and that will not end because we don't believe only in this life despite being a a, a christian he went on talking about this there are so many references there are some other occasions when i was looking for uh, the essay the inaudible resonance of english poetry in india i wrote to him it was not available uh, these are better days now things could be available easily in different form someone has and could share it but those were not those days and i could have a copy of that from him with the golden letters with 
golden words and uh, a kind of blessing. And then another one, when the best of Jayant Mahapatra came from Bodhi Publications, I said, sir, uh, I need that introduction. Now it is available. Sahitya Academy has brought the Jayant Mahapatra reader. That article is also there. P.P. Ravindra's introduction to that volume. So that book is out of print, uh, but I... You don't need the book, you already have the poems. But the introduction, if I, if I am able to locate, I will share. And I think within two months or so, that came. Hmm. It's a moment to, uh, to read that from my personal treasure. He got a photocopy and wrote this. Before that, we had met in Durg. He had come for a, a seminar. And there, in 2005, it was exactly 22nd of October, 2005. And we all know that is his birthday. And the organizers, one of my friends there, one of my juniors, I should say, a classmate, who became junior for some, some reasons not academic. And Mohit Kere, Professor Mohit Kere Lake, uh, Ray and uh, Professor Rama Kundu and others, we had an evening and then a surprise. And there was a cake and happy birthday to him and he was all in tears. And he said he, his birthday had been celebrated for the first time in any, anywhere in any, uh, and in academic circles. It was, uh, never to be thought of, but it was there. And it was there, I, I requested him uh, about this volume, especially the introduction. And within a couple of months, it came. And these are the few lines. Uh, it is just for our, our students. It has been in my personal treasure. The two letters, the other I couldn't locate. But this one, dear Krishna Mohan, it was a pleasure meeting with you at the Duruk seminar. I am truly happy that I could spend some time with you. I suppose relationships matter with much more to me than, say, poetry awards. And Duruk gave me the opportunity for this. I trust you had a pleasant journey back to Kashi, a place that keeps generating a feeling of togetherness. Here is there is something for literature, Sahitya, we call it Sahitya. Huh. Uh, literature doesn't connote that meaning. I am grateful to Professor Rajaram Merotra, who is sadly no more, for taking me there. As per your wish, I enclose the introduction to my book, which is no more available. With warm and sincere good wishes, Jayant Bhai. This is how uh, he could address a, a, a young, young teacher. And I am happy to share that the first of my research scholars worked on the mythical landscapes of Jayant Mahapatra. Hmm. Uh, this much of the personal side, and one thing with it, that volume of random descent, he wrote, read, recited five poems in the evening, and then wrote a line and in happy in memory of happy days at Dur, and that has remained as a treasure again with me. Uh, came like an unexpected rain. Huh. melting not just my body, wetting not just my body, but also something that we call soul within me. 
that kind of thing ah uh, there has been much talk about his personal life the reviews the poetry ah uh, readers the problems of publication problems of recognition politics involved therein but this has been this has been the case since times immemorial and there were times when there have been times where in which poets have not been revered much yes we were looking for a, a suitable boy for my niece Nani, he was a good poet. करता क्या है कविता लिखता है अच्छा है ब्राइट है और क्या करता है नो दिस काइंड ऑफ थिंग एज बिकॉज वी स्टार्टेड लुकिंग एट पोएट्री ओनली एज इफ इट इज अजफुल आर्ट वी डिडेंट मेक दैट काइंड ऑफ डिस्टिंगशन इन आवर ट्रेडिशन यूजफुल आर्ट एंड आर्ट्स एंड फाइन आर्ट्स इट्स एन इंपोर्टेड वन एंड वी स्टार्टेड लुकिंग इन that very frame so uh so i talked about the universality of uh poetry what is it that makes it immortal and one of the things is that it is cap- it should be capable of making a beyonding of time addressing the time addressing the basic issues and being capable of making a beyonding of it then the last poems do it so i am reminded of peter brooks uh, performance of maha direction of mahabharat and he said uh, elliot and odyssey do not give the answer to my questions as the mahabharat gives he looked at it covers it influences the whole earth so if it influences the whole earth his characters came from in one of the conversations we could have drone from africa dronachar from africa bhishma from japan karn from malaysia for universality if it is the whole universe let us have those characters and see what happens in janaka's poems we find this kind of thing happening that he will pick use a word from someone and it will remind dear yes, sir it overdoes it and so we have to to work hard but i am quoting a shlok from kalidas and you see what does he do there are so many such references in in mahapatra i'll be coming to that tam abhya gachhat ruditam sari kavi kushetma haranay yata nishad vidhan daj darshanottham श्लोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोकोको
but we should also remember that there were so many models available in our country we might have a philosopher king in janak we might have a sanyasi king bhartrihari we might have a tapasvi king ram we might also have a poet king king bhoj the only one who says in this capital there is only poets can live a unique kind of thing a different kind of ideal republic the indian way of looking at poetry in dharanagari in the capital only poets could live so a new poet comes and recites poems is given some paritoshi some award but he says i need something more i need a house to stay here and no house was vacant so the king said okay just find out some house for me. and the minister looked at one house of a weaver i come from the city of weaver kabir jo mali bunte hi nahi the ha unka tana bana alag hota tha उन्होंने चद्दर ली त्यों की ज्यों की त्यों रख दी है ज्यों की त्यों धर दी सब लिया आई एम वॉज आई एम वॉज अनएजुकेटेड पीपुल से ही वॉज अन एजुकेटेड एंड हिस्स ताना बाना वॉज सुषमन तार से भी नहीं चल रही है इवा पिंगला एंड सुषुमना एंड ही सेज इट सो सिंपली एंड वी से ही वॉज अन एजुकेटेड एज इफ बींग एजुकेटेड इन है डिग्री as the modern is to know english only we have that alternative mode of modernity medieval mode 6th century 7th century bhakti poets women poets 16th century poets alternative modernities and we think of only bengal renaissance becoming indian renaissance yes issues were there but there were different ways of looking at it in the morning session there was much discussion between uh, pre independence poetry and post independence one hmm. pre independence being represented by two three i am also talked about it uh, especially the two i remember one of the uh, one of my colleagues late professor shivasto unko main samajhdar samajhta tha i for the first time i was given gitanjali to teach Uh, my colleagues at Kashi Vidya Pit thought, Sir knows the very close friend of Sir R P Singh. Now you you can teach uh, teach Sri Aurobindo Savitri and Gitanjali. For the first time, it was given to me. I was so overjoyed. And one of my colleagues said, "Unko to samajhdar samajhta tha. Tum Indian Indian mein kahan phas gaye?" It was this kind of and. he was a great scholar yes a scholar is such a scholar of a padma shri sahitya academy award winner his thesis had been evaluated by m h abrams no less a critic than m h abrams yes he had every right to say so but being blind to the other kind of tradition being blind to one's own tradition tumko samajhdar samajhta tha indian indian mein kahan phas gaye that kind of thing and that to i meant as late 80s uh, this mindset needs to be changed uh, so uh, this poet king they found the weaver and uh, thought he should be ousted and the weaver comes comes to the court says sir yes my livelihood is by weaving but i am a poet as well ordinary poet i write poems kavyam karomi nahi charu karam karomi yatnat karomi yadi charu karam karomi gopal maul mani manjit raj peech ye sahasan kavayam vayam yam these three words kavayam vayam yam i am a poet i write poems When I make effort, when I chisel them, polish them, 
they become better poems sometimes better poems and you are one of the best of the kings bhopal mohan manyamit rajpeet he sahasan hey if you say yes i am going but these three things i do you should remember kavayam i write poems vayam i weave cloths and yam i am going so one word this very addition kavayam vayam yam and the story as it has come to us through tradition tradition is that which keeps on renewing itself as we look at it when we place these two words together tradition and modernity it seems as if tradition is fossilized and modernity is a continuously upgrading itself that was not tradition that was rohi and our scholars our chintakas our manishis kept on saying hmm, renovate yourself रामकृष्ण परमहंस जी से लोटा रोज मानना चाहिए उनका एक शब्द है मेकिंग एफर्ट एवरी डे सो दैट काइंड ऑफ थिंग टॉकिंग अबाउट दिस ट्रेडिशन एंड मॉडर्निटी वंस पंडित हजारी प्रसाद द्विवेदी यूज वन श्लोक बी सरप्राइज आई टू वॉज सरप्राइज वन आई रेड दैट आई हैड इट फ्रॉम माई फादर he delivered some lecture in ayodhya and where he talked about it kaha gazab ka kaam talking about parampara and adhunikta